Thank you, Tom. And after um, Tom talk about sort of physical assets and assets as something you can draw on with economic capital, I now want to um, think a bit more broadly about what we, community assets might be and talk about social capital as an asset. And I, um, I know um, some people um, uh, tuning in on the web are particularly interested in this and our um, work I did with um, uh, partners at uh, University of Edinburgh, University of Leicester, and uh, the local community in a neighbourhood called Wester Hales on developing social capital through uh, Web2 and social media. To frame this, um, to this project a bit more, um, we're coming at this of um, thinking about Wester Hales, which is a deprived neighbourhood. It's in um, most of the neighbourhood is in the bottom 15% of the um, Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation. It's a um, stigmatised neighbourhood. It has a notoriety about it, and many um, uh, scholars have done work on this. Um, famously, the French um, sociologist Louis Vacant um, talked about this in terms of the banlieue, the um, peripheral um, housing estates in French cities. Dina Hastings, in their work on stigma and social housing estates, they highlight that it is inappropriate to talk of the image of an estate. Rather, there are fractured images. Individuals emphasise different aspects of the estate. And that's really what, I want, what we've been able to get at with this project around um, social media. In terms of stigma, neighbourhoods like um, Wester Hales, they are, are marked by the physicality. They often look very different from other neighbourhoods. They're marked by difference in tenure. They're often dominated by, particularly in Scotland, dominated by um, socially rented housing rather than owner occupation. Um, and unfortunately, they've also often been um, marked by disinvestment, and this is a particular case in Wester Hales, and disinvestment by local public authorities who just weren't willing to in spend the money to make the neighbourhood a decent place to live. And also marked by the notoriety and myth, the horrible headlines in local newspapers. I think one of the striking examples of this sort of stigma in um, British history is the famous Cutterslow Walls in Oxford. And this is an image of one of the walls. There were two of them. And what we're looking at is the council housing built in the 1920s. And on this side of the wall was private housing. And the owner occupiers in the private housing built this wall to keep the ruffians in the council estate back. So a really shocking physical mark of the sort of stigma around these types of neighbourhoods. In Wester Hale's case, it was um, subject to a large amount of uh, regeneration in the 1990s. And these are two um, images from um, Wester Hale's. This is back in the 1980s prior to the regeneration. You can see there it's a neighbourhood marked by um, physicality, big high-rise flats that were very uncommon in Edinburgh. And now they've, um, it's a neighbourhood where they've reopened the canal, new housing um, delivered by the Housing Association during the regeneration period, and the former high-rise blocks have been renewed and are a lot nicer. But Wester Hale still has a uh, stigma around it and there's a, uh, residents uh, perceive this stigma. So this is a quote from my, my doctoral research. When I first lived here, Wester Hales Drive, you couldn't escape from Wester Hales. That was your address, Wester Hales Drive, you know. And I was unemployed a lot of the time. Uh, going for a job because of your address was difficult, you know, because Wester Hales had this reputation. We're all thieves, crooks and drug addicts. Another resident spoke of how they look down the hill at us, you know. They can't, we're in the middle, but they're still looking down, down the hill at us because we're part of Wester Hales and they do not want to be involved with Wester Hales. This stigma has been um, long been part of Wester Hales history. And if we turn back time, uh, for those of you who are looking online, now would be a really good time to get Facebook open in another window in your browser. Um, if you turn back time, unfortunately I can't click on this link and show you the video, but if you're watching online, you might be able to access this. Back in the 1970s, a community newspaper was founded in Wester Hales called the Wester Hales Sentinel, and it fought to try and change this image of Wester Hales. It brought together um, a fantastic range of community stories to show that Wester Hales was actually just a normal, normal neighbourhood. Yes, a lot of people in the neighbourhood suffered social or experienced social exclusion and poverty, but they were just getting on with their lives and living reasonably normal lives. If we move forward to 2008, back in 2007, I think it was, um, the City of Edinburgh Council ceased funding to the Wester Hale Sentinel. And, um, the, and they had a big archive of all the old editions of the newspaper and all the old photos from the newspaper. So there's a big question about, well, what do we do with this? And thankfully for us as university partners and thankfully for Wester Hales, the local housing association um, took uh, the, on this um, uh, 
this archive. And if you want to, you can use this QR code to access the fantastic Facebook um, site that was developed using these archives called From There to Here, A Wester Hale Story. So if you're online, uh, if you're watching this on the webinar, you can access this Facebook site now and you can um, click through and have a look at it yourself. I really would encourage you to do that because it's a fantastically rich resource of social capital. And so basically all what this this Facebook page um, has allowed the Housing Association to do is essentially every Thursday get a range of photos on a theme from the archive of the newspaper, scan them in and pop them online on the timeline. So this is a Facebook timeline you all know and love and this is what it looks like on the From There to Here page. The photos cover a range of different um, subjects so as you can see there um, fest the festival, um, shops, the fun run, um, changing views about how the neighbourhood has physically changed over time. Um, and the great thing with Facebook and why this site really took off very quickly is the ability on Facebook, as you do with those embarrassing photos of your friend, you can, friends, you can tag their faces. And that's what people did whenever there were photos on this Facebook page of people back in the day and their faces. So here, this is one of the shop's photos. And this person here, you can see I've, I've blacked out the name for... Um, uh, because this person didn't submit their comments to Facebook knowing they'd be presented to the world. So, but you can see from the little, little highlight that somebody has tagged that person's um, uh, face and then that's gone to their Facebook account and that's generated this big, long conversation um, down the side about uh, uh, reminiscing about the old shopping centre. And some of the stories um, that are... Pa uh, told on this Facebook site are absolutely fascinating. And one me and the other um, researchers keep going back to is the story of the crows. <laughs> Um, this is a photo of the, West, the shopping centre in Wester Hales from the 1980s. And you can, as you can see, it's a pretty miserable place. It's just concrete building, not somewhere where you want to go. And it's not a particularly good photo of the shopping centre. So you'd think that wouldn't, wouldn't get much interest at all. But it was quite amazing how quickly this, there was interest in this photo and the sort of interest that was generated. So it was posted on September the 14th, and they usually go on um, sort of about 3.30ish, 4 o'clock time, and pretty much within minutes of it going in uh, online, Tracy has come on and said, wow, that's really brought back a vivid memory to her. This is her growing up in, this, in, this, in Wester Hales. It's brought back all the memories. Um, four minutes later, Sandy has chipped in saying, oh, the old centre, I remember this. And continues, um, oh my God, this brings back memories. And then if we go down to um, Pamela, who is just there, she, um, she chips in with, oh, oh no, it's Michael, Michael before, um, chips in with, who remembers the old black crow that used to be, be at the big stones all the time, trying to pinch food from people? And Pamela chips in with, I remember that crow, used to fly, fly off with bags of um, crisps and mob you for chips. And Nikki comes in, I remember that crow too. And this continues on <laughs> and on, <laughs> even more. Um, and these are just people, a lot of these are just people going, wow, and a lot of memories, but even more um, uh, references to the crows um, around the shopping centre. And it goes on yet further. And um, I think I stopped this at um, May the 10th um, this year. And I th think the conversations continued since then about this very boring photo of the shopping centre. And it's these sorts of stories, it's the development of social capital through these stories that we find utterly interesting. And another a good example I've um, not put on the slides is um, if you go on and look at some of the photos of the high-rise blocks, people have recognised where they lived in high-rise blocks and tagged themselves there and say, oh, I used to live there. And then they'll realise that somebody who they're friends with now used to live a few doors down. And, oh, yeah, I, oh, I didn't realise you lived there. And so yet more of this... Um, evocation of this social capital. So we have this fantastic resource, that's this amazing um, site that's going on, now up to um, 1,900 likes. Um, one of the partners in this project is the Royal Commission for the Ancient and Historical Monuments in Scotland. They're very embarrassed because this page has more likes than their own official Facebook page. <laughs> and um, we were trying to understand, well, what does this mean for community empowerment? What's happening here with these community assets? And we set this in the uh, literature on um, the promise of Web 2, the promise of social media. 
And there's a lot of talk around this that um, Web 2 is um, democratizing the web. We are now all making the web through our Facebook pages, through our tweets. We are making web content. And then within the literature, this varies from digital utopians who are saying, this is going to transform the world. We're all going to be able to um, have our voice in how services are delivered um, to the digital dystopians who go, oh, we're all going to be um, being um, uh, have our photos taken on Google Glass without anybody realizing. And in 10 years' time, you'll have these embarrassing photos on Facebook, and it'll all be a disaster. And so there's kind of two key um, bits of literature here. And we were interested in, well, how does this fit into this literature? Where are we in this? What, what is going on here? But first of all, we wanted to see if we get even more people using the Facebook site. So we did a very, very mad thing that um, was a continuation of previous projects, um, was put up a four meter high totem pole. Um, the totem pole was um, uh, led by a local arts organization, Whale. Um, and the, uh, in partnership with um, the local community, it was designed and um, carved by a carver and then um, put on the totem pole QR codes so people could walk past the, um, the totem pole, scan the QR codes with their phone and access the digital resources. So this is bringing this cloud of computing down into the physical community. And then in a very cold day in December last year, the totem pole was unveiled by the Lord Provost of Edinburgh, um, uh, Right Honourable Donald Wilson. And here it is, um, four metres of glory. And we can say with some pride that um, six months later, it's, well, five months later, it's still there. Every time when I cycle to Wester Hales, I'm just staggered when I look at it and think, oh my God, we put a totem pole up in Wester Hales. And the idea behind this was to, as I say, bring the, the, the cloud of computing physically down to the place. And can we use this to get even more of this social capital? It's not been there very long, so we're still um, finding our way with that. And I think Caroline will talk about more about um, how the totem pole is going and the process around that. What we're particularly interested in, um, or, or well, what was, um, so what happened with that totem pole and how we got there? Well, we had lots of meet meetings. Um, a key challenge actually for us was getting planning permission to actually get the thing in the ground and we didn't realise how um, long that process was going to be. And actually the process of getting the totem pole into the ground took a long time and um, we were very, very lucky and um, the Scottish Hub Initiative were funding a health um, centre being built nearby and the contractors for that, Morrisons, very kindly agreed to install the totem pole for us as part of the community benefits, so that was great. What we were interested in though was... Um, uh, whether this social capital could be used to develop what we term bridging social capital. So enable the community in Wester Hales to reach out to neighbourhoods around and challenge some of that stigma. And this is a, one, a fantastic image from our partners in the project Arcams of the um, of fourth bridge being built. So yeah, the question is, can we build social capital here? Can we reach out between very different neighbourhoods to engage neighbourhoods a lot? Why does this matter? Well. Big story recently on the, British, on the BBC News website was the Great British Class Calculator. I'm sure we all did it. Um, it must have done because it was a top story for about two weeks. And the, one of the categories on that was around social capital. And you had to choose which people you knew socially. And basically, if you ticked university lecturer like I did, it gave you a lot of class points when you came out at the end of it. And so in terms of so social capital matters because it's recognised that if you know a university lecturer, if you know um, an accountant, you're going to be able to use those resources to get on in life. So we have these um, photos that are eliciting stories, and these stories describe quite complex attachments to the place of Wester Hales. And the question then for us, uh, well, is it support, is it can we turn this into bridging capital or is it just supporting bonding capital? And by bonding capital, we mean that sort of just getting on with your friends, the sort of ca social capital that lets you get by rather than the social capital um, that lets you get on. Well, great thing about the fact this was used on Facebook was Facebook, if you have a page with over a thousand likes, you get access to the thing called Facebook Insights data, which is an absolute gold mine. It tells you everything you need to know as a social scientist about who is using your Facebook page. So I looked at the uh, Facebook Insights data for the site for six months last year, and I could find out the gender, and most useful, usefully for me, I could find out the gender and also um, the age of the people using the website. 
And essentially, um, it's, it is supporting bonding capital. To sum up these graphs for you, you can look at them in uh, greater uh, detail um, at leisure. But it's basically what we've created here is a lot of middle-aged women sitting around having a cup of tea and nattering about good old times in Wester Hales. <laughs> So what does, this, what does this tell us? Well, immediately, um, for us, um, it's the fact that social media is media. It's something that actually most people passively interact with. You're not making it, you're just absorbing it. And therefore, like any other media, who engages with it is based on the content. So at this time, period of time, we're getting a lot of middle-aged women commenting and engaging with the Facebook site because we were posting photos featuring them from the 1980s and early 1990s. So essentially, if you, t you, if you tailor your content on any social media um, resource to an audience, you will get that audience. It's also um, led um, me and um, sort of jokingly uh, been uh, uh, in conversation with a researcher from Birmingham City University on this to, uh, to come up with this idea of banalism. Actually, a lot of what goes on in social media, uh, social media and Web2 is far, far away from the utopian ideas of uh, new democracies being created. It's really, really boring, banal stuff. It's reminiscence and it's narratives of everyday life. But I just think, is this a problem? And looking back at the, the great thing with the archives of the Sentinel, it enables us to say, well, no, it's not a problem because this is what community news and community empowerment is based on. It's based on sharing stories and it's based on pretty banal stuff. So this is a page from the um, uh, West Hale Sentinel back in the 1980s. And this is just very little, little stories from all the different neighborhoods in West Hale about very, very boring things, the sort of things that people are talking about on the Facebook site. And if this can fill a newspaper, then it can, I think it can empower communities today. So just to end with some concluding thoughts before I hand over to um, uh, Caroline. So what, what was our involvement as a university here? Well, essentially, um, we act, the universities here act as a catalyst. We could lever in some resources, but universities as partners, we're really expensive. So actually, we got two grants from the Arts and Humanities Research Council to help with this project, but essentially that paid for the university's time. The, um, it did pay for the totem pole and paid for some other bits and pieces, and they were relatively cheap in terms of the big picture. It was I, me and my academic colleagues were very uh, expensive. So also there's a limit to what universities can do. We couldn't parachute into Wester Hales and um, empower them. Actually, Wester Hales is getting on really well on its own. And what we were there to do was actually to help our research and to learn more about what's going on in Wester Hales. We weren't there as um, do middle class do-gooders to help Wester Hales. Also quite important to recognize that academics are selfish. I say we're there to do our research. I was there because I've got um, uh, frameworks in my life like the research excellence framework I have to do research I have to produce papers that's what I was there, here to do in this research and I've got some fantastic research findings here yeah I have done it for the community but I've also done it for myself and also I have to highlight academics are a pain to work with we're very very busy we ignore emails and we're very very hard to get a hold of <laughs> so that's another key thing to bear in mind when you're working in partnership with the university on these um, sorts of projects. And I'll hand over to Caroline, who will give her impression of what, what it's like to work with us. 